prayers to our beloved spiritual master, ISKCON's founder, Acharya, His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, and to the presiding deities uh, of Dallas Temple, Sri Sri Radha Kalachanji, Radha Govinda, Sri Sri Gorni Thai, and uh, Sri Jagannath Baladev and Subhadra Devi. All of you who have come here are to be congratulated that you could resist the attraction to Super Bowl 31 <laughs> and found Sri Sri Radha Kalachanji more attractive than some huge hulks <laughs> throwing a ball back and forth on a field. <coughs> I thought today that I would speak from a verse from the Bhagavad Gita. Um, which um, is a, is in the sixteenth chapter, uh, text number eight. Asatyam Apratishtam Te Jagat Ahur Anishvaram Aparas Parasambhutam Kim and yet come away to come. They say that this world is unreal, with no foundation, no God in control. They say it is produced by sex desire and has no cause other than lust. This is uh, in a chapter which is entitled The Divine and the Demoniac natures. And in the purport, Srila Prabhupada emphasizes or uh, focuses on the material scientific uh, idea that everything is simply a result of the interaction of matter. Uh, whatever we see within this material cosmos is simply temporary and uh, there is no spirit behind it. Neither uh, within our body is there anything called a spirit or a soul, but it is simply the combination of material elements. That's what Prabhupada emphasizes. And another point uh, occurred to me as I was reading this verse and I discussed it today earlier on with some devotees. Um, how the materialistic view is that um, that there are problems in the world today and uh, everyone is making an effort to try to understand how to solve such problems. But the consequence is that the problems only be, seem to be grow more and more serious. Uh, problems in regard to society. We see how uh, society has become industrialized and persons live more and more in big cities. Even those who live in rural settings or small towns really don't live any longer in small towns because uh, the culture of the city is televised into the small town homes through television. I don't know how many cable you know, stations there are, but I think people can practically now choose from a hundred or more such stations. Uh, communication, transportation, etc., revolutions in these have brought everybody into a type of a global, they call it a global village. And now, you know, the uh, information highway, superhighway, has really linked everyone in a way that was never practically imaginable before. Um, 
Now the question arises, is it possible to solve the problems which exist in the world today under the present, in the present society? Uh, it is, as far as I can understand from Prabhupada's teachings, Prabhupada says it is really not possible. And this is a very uh, difficult position to take because in a sense it's a condemnation of the modern world. Uh, there's a, uh, a dialogue which goes on between uh, conservative, very traditional conservative uh, believers of various religions and liberals. And liberals generally hold to the idea that we can adjust the principles, uh, religious principles of any particular religion to the time, the place, and the circumstances. And certainly there is some, uh, some leeway for doing that in Prabhupada's instructions. For example, if we are using a microphone, which is certainly a modern invention. Um, we are using electricity, you know, which is another modern invention. And it goes on and on. There are so many things which uh, we have the use of, that we make use of. And uh, the, the fact is that there is some license for that in Prabhupada's instructions. However, uh, it's okay. Howdy, Bob. We're going to just... So, uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, Prabhupada does give some accommodation for using the facilities of the world. However, we, um, we see in Prabhupada's overall scheme that he says that these facilities should be utilized for spreading Krishna consciousness. But once Krishna consciousness is spread, Prabhupada presents a very different blueprint for what will solve the problems of the world. And he presents those in schemes like his uh, rural communities. Before coming to America, when Prabhupada was still in India, Prabhupada wrote an essay uh, in which he described a place called Gita Nagari, a place where the Gita uh, is, you know, the, you can say a, a town or a village in which the Gita, the Song of God, is the foundation. And um, there have been various communities even established in America in the past. They were called utopian communities. And the word utopia has a funny connotation, not funny, but it, it implies something. When we say something is utopian, it's very grandiose, uh, you know, very hard to realize, unlikely to realize, almost beyond our grasp. And practically, most of these uh, utopian communities failed. There are still some uh, which, like the Quakers, are a type of utopian community, and they, they still exist. And, of course, we have our rural communities, and they are existing, and there are not quite a few alternative lifestyle, you know, communities of, you know, which are also going on. There's some, something about the religious utopias that they all have in common, which is that they wanted to establish a community centered on God. And a second uh, common principle is that they believed that there had to be a very simple lifestyle. And this is the point that I want to make. That, um, from what I can understand, and what Prabhupada has taught, it is very difficult 
to um, do away with the present day problems of the world when the problems themselves are either caused by or aggravated by the modern society we're living in. For example, when people used to live in a village, just like in India, why in India, even in America, people used to live in small communities where you knew everyone very well and where the job that you had was in that same place. So that, for example, the kind of way that you performed at your job was important not only in terms of how it produced money or results, but in terms of the kind of moral quality of your work. For example, if you were cheating, supposing you were a shopkeeper and you cheated, everyone in the town or village would know about it and they would ostracize you. You wouldn't be able to live peacefully under such a circumstance. Your family, your husband or wife or children, whatever, would all be looked down upon because of your moral transgressions. But nowadays, the place where people work is completely separate from where they live. People have separated their public life and their private life. So that what they do in public doesn't bear on what they do privately. That means that you can be a big cheater in business and still go to church or a temple or a synagogue and everyone may think you're a saint. Because no one sees what you did when you're in your office or wherever you did your cheating. Uh, in the same way, uh, the relationships people establish when they're doing business, for example, or climbing the corporate ladder, has no real permanence. Uh, someone works in a particular town or city and then in order to get ahead has to move to another city. And all of the roots, all of the relationships which have been established, they all become uprooted suddenly so that people lose their, they lose their uh, sense of belonging. They lose their ability to relate nicely with each other as human beings. So these types of situations create uh, strains in relationships, seriously damage the quality of human life. Um, People can't live in a healthy environment. For example, we can't imagine how much we're affected just by the, you know, all of the waves of different types of waves that are in the air. You know, sometimes we worry about pollution, like too much pollution from automobile engines. But the kind of pollution that comes from electricity and various types of subtle waves is just as damaging. One of the biggest problems people have in this day and age, they can't even sleep at night and they work very hard. It used to be that when a person put in an honest day's work, the easiest thing in the world to do at night was to go to sleep. Now people have to consult doctors in order to be able to sleep. They did studies on reproduction. They found that it was, uh, that uh, if that, the potency of men is becoming reduced in an alarming rate. You know, every decade it's like 10% less potent. I mean, these are most basic human functions. Sleeping, reproducing, people can't even do them anymore. So, the point I'm trying to drive home is that the present uh, society as it has evolved is itself so uh, detrimental that it creates problems and aggravates problems in such a way that no one will be able to live peacefully in the present day world. Now what is the solution? I'm not going to just talk about the problem.
because that's not bad, but that's not complete to only describe the problem. One thing is that we can believe that we can change the whole world. And I'm not saying that that can't happen, but I think the likelihood of it happening is, you know, miraculous at best. I mean, it's going to happen only by miracle. Guys. Srila Prabhupada once said about this that the only way that the thing will change is by another world war. Obviously, Prabhupada was not wishing for another world war, but Prabhupada was saying that the situation is so bad that except for a world war, people are not going to be willing to change. What would it require to change? Well, for example, let us see what Prabhupada uh, ideally described. He said that we should live, we should have um, self-sufficient communities where the basis of the economy is the land and the cows and bulls. Now you tell that to most people in Dallas, the only thing they can think about when they hear cow and bull, I, you know, is McDonald's. <laughs> they can't imagine that a cow and bull is for anything except for eating. But actually in the Vedic culture, the cow is considered to be a mother and the bull is considered to be a father for very good reason, because they sustain life. The cow nourishes us with her milk and the bull uh, helps to till the fields, uh, work in the fields, so it's like a father. Um, in such a society, Prabhupada said, we wouldn't use petroleum. Now, if you take away petroleum, can you imagine what that will do to our present world? If you look at the clothing you're wearing, much of the clothes we wear are synthetic clothing. They're made from petroleum products. In fact, you know, maybe a third of the products in the world are made from petroleum. Now to draw petroleum out of the earth, we are extracting petroleum all the time. There are many big petroleum companies. In fact, much of the uh, 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 Asian Indian community is involved, right, in the petroleum business. <laughs> so now I'm, anyway. So, what, what happens when you take petroleum out of the earth? Now Prabhupada said that this drilling of the earth destabilizes the earth. Now everybody has been noticing that there's a gradual shifting, you know, of the polar, whatever the, what? Axis. Axis is shifting. And obviously it hasn't started shifting just from the time that they dug oil wells. However, Prabhupada's point is that the earth contains certain liquids within it which help to balance it and determine its, it, its, its condition. And that when you keep extracting ext petroleum out of the earth, it throws off the balance of the earth. Apart from that, uh, petroleum products are, you know, People are you know, suffering, for example, from cancer, and they can't always understand why. But these petroleum products, in, on a long-term basis, create so many problems for the body. <laughs> petroleum is in everything. Petroleum is in soap detergents, you know, so when you wash your, your cup and plate, a film stays on it, and then you eat from that same plate, and little bits of this stuff goes into your body. When you wear petroleum products in the form of clothing, your body can't breathe properly. I mean, I'm only, you know, I couldn't begin to give you the whole picture. That's why, for example, in India and in, uh, basic in older cultures, what kind of clothing did they use? Wool and cotton. Natural products. And, uh, when they wanted to go somewhere, they didn't go very far. You go as far as you could go by foot or as far as you could go with the help of an animal. You didn't get on a jet plane or on a boat. And if you did, it was a major thing. 
If someone went on a boat, it was once in their life to go to another place. They didn't come back and forth, and they didn't certainly take ocean cruises for pleasure. So what does this mean? It means to give up a certain style of living that we have now become very much accustomed to. Conveniences, for example. It also means that it will be very difficult to live in certain parts of the world, at least in a certain way. For example, if you wanted to live in very cold climates, it would be very difficult. That's why most of the great civilizations in ancient times were not in cold climates. They were in places like in Africa, in India, in South America, in places that had temp very temperate or warm climates especially. Like in India, you can grow things all year long. But you can't do that in most northern climates. So, <clears throat> it will require major adjustments. But if we have a very simple, now you might say, what is the purpose of this? The purpose of it is to reduce life to such a simple system where you can live in a very natural way and depend upon the gift, n nature's gifts. And nature means God's gifts. And your life becomes much more peaceful. It, won't, it will become free of the anxiety that you suffer now. It will become free from so many of the troubles which plague us today. If we don't do this, then there's no solution, as far as I can see, to the problems which plague society. If we do do this, it's very difficult. Now, my thought is, and I believe that this was Prabhupada's thought, that whereas we cannot necessarily influence everyone to change their ways, at least we can make some ideal models to follow. This particular temple is not that type of ideal model. This temple is a temple meant for preaching. If you want to have an ideal lifestyle, you don't do it, you know, 200 yards away from an interstate. That's not where you build an ideal model. You go to some nice setting. But if we do that, then all of you would have trouble coming. Therefore, uh, Prabhupada and his guru Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said, put the temples in the middle of the cities where the most people can easily access them. For what purpose? To learn so that they can come and learn the philosophy. Actually, Prabhupada and Bhakti Siddhanta gave more emphasis to learning the philosophy than just having darshan of the deity. Most, most people, I would say, you know, in, we can say at least amongst the Hindus, darshan is, is more popular than hearing the philosophy. Because, and there's some reason for that, in the sense that seeing the deity, having the darshan of the deity, is certainly purifying. However, if we don't hear the philosophy, if we don't start thinking about how life should be lived properly, then it's not certain that having a darshan of the deity will change your, your habits. In other words, the deity, unless you're very advanced, you won't hear the deity talking to you. The deity is not going to instruct you saying, you know what you did earlier today was not very good. In other words, you can get away with a lot with darshan. But with hearing the philosophy, it's more difficult to get away. Because you're confronted with uh, the truth in a way which you know, speaks to you personally in terms of your own life day to day. The temple is therefore a place to hear the philosophy, primarily, and as well as to teach a standard of deity worship, because obviously you can't come to the temple every day. Therefore, one of the recommendations is that you should establish in your own home a temple. And coming to this temple, or the, the larger temple, is to learn the standard of deity worship. Sometimes people ask me, 
uh, would it be all right if I establish a deity of Radha and Krishna in my home? But then I asked them, uh, do you understand what that means? Do you really understand what it means to establish a deity of Radha and Krishna? For example, you wouldn't, you know, so easily think, uh, I, I think I'll just get married today. Marriage is a very serious decision. Because you know that when you get married, you have to consider another person constantly. And not only one person, but after a while, there's a good chance there'll be more than one person in the family. There'll be children. Well, when we install the deity of Radha and Krishna in our home, we have to realize we have just brought two persons into our home. And they aren't just two ordinary persons. They happen to be the supreme personality of Godhead in their form of Radha and Krishna. And you're going to have to reckon with that if you take it seriously. If you don't, then really you shouldn't establish the deity of Radha and Krishna or Gornita in your home. If you're not prepared to actually treat the deities as persons in as much of a way as you would treat your husband or your wife or children, and probably even more so, or uh, ideally even more so, don't install a deity in your home. Because you're going to make offense. Now, it's a serious matter to have to do deity worship. Which is another reason why in this day and age, the me recommended method of worshiping God is not by deity worship, not by archa vigraha worship, but by chanting God's names. Because the, the, to worship the deity requires many qualities and conditions. For example, you're not supposed to actually worship a deity if you're in a contaminated condition. Now, I will not belabor this point too much, except to just say that under strict standards, most of you who are sitting here today could not come into the temple. In the South Indian temple, for example, you can't go into the temple, I wouldn't be able to go into the temple, because I'm wearing a shirt which has stitches in it. Women are exempted from that, but men are not. They have many standards, and certainly in any temple, the tradition is you don't go into the temple unless you're in clean clothing. Now you may say, well, my clothes are clean. <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, all right. that's right, dry clean, but dry cleaning is not cleaning. Cleaning means with, if it's cotton, it means with water. And if it's wool, it means by sun. It's got to be, you know, so if you're wearing clothing that hasn't been freshly laundered, you can't come in technically into a temple. And that includes your body. You can't, if you're not bathed, therefore you'll see, not only, just think about this, not only do they expect you to bathe your body, but for example, in a temple like Tirupati, where the Balaji deity is, as you enter the temple, in front of the temple, there's a running stream of water. You don't come into the temple with your shoes on. You have bare feet and you walk through this running stream of water so that because, even though you've already taken a bath, from the time you took your bath to get to the temple, so much dust came on your feet. You got contaminated, so your feet get... I'm, I'm just trying to show you. There's, I was reading a book. There's a lot of common things between Brahminical culture and Rabbinical culture. The Jewish culture had this thing about cleanliness also. So we have put aside all of those rules. We have put aside all those rules. One time, the poet uh, Ginsburg said to Prabhupada that Swamiji, you are too strict. And Prabhupada said, if I was strict, he said, I would have practically no one here. He said, you do not know how liberal I am. So in this day and age, when we can't follow all of these rules, the recommended method of worshipping God is by chanting His holy names. There's no hard and fast rules for chanting. Prabhupada says even a child can chant Hare Krishna and dance in ecstasy. And again, that is why we give central importance to the kirtans. Sometimes people say, your Iskand kirtans are too loud. 
they're too energetic. We want to see the deity and we're getting distracted. Well, but you have to understand that the main worship in Kali Yuga, Hariyanama, 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 Eva Kevalam, Kalua Nasjeva, 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 Katir Danyata. In the Kali Yuga, in this age of hypocrisy and quarrel, the best way of worshipping God is through His holy names. So, uh, this temple is one thing for preaching. And we ideally must also set up some model societies, communities in rural settings which are self-sufficient. Where we can show on a small scale, just a few of us perhaps, that you see you can live peacefully. You can be happy if you're prepared to simplify your necessities. But it does require a great deal of sacrifice. And even within ISKCON, the attempts to do this have not yet been perfect. We have never yet been able, even despite Prabhupada's instruction, to carry out this order perfectly. It's very difficult. Imagine, no petroleum, no oil. If you want to use lamps at night, you can use lamps, but you've got to get cotton seed or something, some kind of oil, linseed oil or some uh, uh, sesame oil. So, these are some thoughts that came to me today when I was reading this verse about real and unreal world and how people try to set up society without God at the center and how they think that they will tr solve the problems, hope to solve the problems of life without God in the formula. But actually, I don't think it is possible. Our Pujari has appeared which is the indication that Radha Kalachanji is soon to appear. So we should all uh, now get ready, rise up to greet Sri Sri Radha Kalachanji and the other deities for the performance of their Arti Sarva. Hare Krishna. Amen.